I'm really pleased to be here, and thank you for that introduction, Grant. Uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be here so I can speak about my favorite subjects, which are insight and innovation, um, and execution is a big piece of bringing all those things to the marketplace. So thank you very much for the kind invitation. I'd love to introduce you to a new way of taking some notes, because I think it would be really useful for you to have some notes um, to work with as you go into the buzz session. So um, if you would, if everybody would grab their, their there's, a, there's pads at everybody's tables, I think. And I'd love for you to do it in this way. Draw a line down the middle, so as you see on this slide. And over on the left side, would be what you're hearing. The words of the speaker, not just myself, but as, you, as the morning and, and the day goes on. So these are kind of your traditional lecture notes. When you were in school, you probably took notes that way. And over on the right side, I have to reverse myself, um, the connections you make. These could be ideas, could be your to-do list, it could be a reminder to, to pick up your dry cleaning on the way home. Anything that really sparks a thought in your head. And I'd really like you to kind of capture that as, as the day goes on, and maybe the next three days, try to use that uh, technique. It's a wonderful technique. We call it in and out listening. And it's really about over on the one side is what's going on in the room, and what's going on on the other side is what's going on in your head and ideas that you promote. So if you try that, I would really uh, appreciate it. So let's, uh, let's get started here. As the world gets more competitive, and the selling environment even more challenging, the one thing that really separates the also rands from the leaders is the ability to generate great insights, to translate those into innovation, and to bring those to the marketplace. What you're doing is really bringing innovation to the marketplace before the marketplace even knows that it needs it. So there's still plenty of opportunities left to discover. You know, Man invented the wheel, what, about 10,000 years ago? And the suitcase was invented around, I think, late 1700s, you know, kind of evolved from trunks and so forth, which were all about kind of carrying your, your belongings. So why did it take so long to put them together? They really laughed at this guy named Bernard Sadow, who walked into a Macy's in 1972, and he was dragging behind him a suitcase that he had put wheels on. And he had gotten that idea because he had come through customs and he had seen somebody pull, pulling some heavy machinery along on a dolly. And he said, that's what I need. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling here to get my suitcase you know, through the airport. So he came up with an idea. He owned a, co a luggage company called US Luggage and he prototype something and he took it into the Macy's buyer. And the Macy's buyer said, no one's gonna, no one's going to buy a suitcase on, you know, with a, wheels on it. Get out of here. I, I, I got your regular stuff in here, but I don't, want, I, I don't want that. So later, he managed to get an appointment with a big muckety-muck at Macy's, a VP. He went in and he showed him the same product. What happened? He, that big mucky muck said, hey, let me call the buyer in here. That is great. And he said, so, to the buyer, what do you think of this new idea? And he looked around, looked at Mr. Sado, said, great, I love it. Let me just buy a few of those and put those in the stores. So, you know, it took how many thousands of years to put them together? Is there anyone here who doesn't have a piece of luggage with wheels on it? It's really about a discontinuous leap. It's about a, a leap in thinking that brings a whole different kind of solution to the marketplace so that you can get into uncontested market space. And to do that, you have to develop insight about your consumers and your customers. That's the key step that helps make those big leaps. It really is something that needs to bring your customers, your consumers, um, into a whole, whole new territory. So what's the real secret to innovation? It's not the principles of Six Sigma, and there may be some Six Sigma devotees here, but innovation is really not about, about that. It's not just about the jobs that a customer or consumer has to do. 
It's not even just about new product development. So those of you in the room would say, oh, well, my responsibility is not new product development, so innovation doesn't matter to me. It's not about that at all. Innovation applies to everyone in the organization and, er and it really every part of the organization, no matter what your functional area. Now, first, to do innovation, you need a foundation. Um, you need a foundation of great people because it's people who, who, uh, who create innovation and you have to, you know, it's not just about rational thinking. People come with their emotional context and so forth and a very rich stimulus base to build on. And then it's really important that you start with the climate. Now, what do I mean by climate? That's kind of a metaphor. Climate is really about how we treat each other, how we treat ourselves, how we, how we get new ideas, how we treat new ideas, um, and how we treat other people's ideas. It's really about the whole behavioral pieces of working together um, with each other and really being receptive to new thinking. So you have to be um, in this diverse group and you have to be open-minded to receiving new ideas. Remember that, that suitcase that Mr. Sadow brought, <clears throat> brought in? That, how do you receive ideas from others? When you hear a colleague, um, one, of your, one of your associates, bring you an idea, how do you, how do you receive that? How do you listen to it? Do you go into critical thinking mode first? Or do you think about what's right with that idea? Because you know what? Most ideas, the gods do not throw down the lightning bolts with the fully formed ideas all ready to go they come down somewhat imperfectly, and they need development. So it's really important how you receive ideas, how you think about them, and being open-minded, looking for the positives of, of a new idea first. And as, as business context, oh, uh, the second piece of the innovation puzzle is in thinking skills. How do you think about something? How do you come up with new, new ideas? You have to make new connections, you have to break the old connections. The art of connection making is all about finding linkages between two things that maybe don't naturally fit together. And the farther apart those two pieces come from, the more chance you have for a breakthrough, uh, a breakthrough idea. And as business contexts change, there are fresh opportunities. Okay. How do your customers see things? It's not just about you going out and asking questions or doing surveys of your customers or consumers. It's really about getting below the surface. So having thinking skills where you can discover what people really need or really want almost before they know it. And the finishing piece is really about process. Having a set of processes for building on ideas for developing ideas, for thinking, for collaboration, for idea development. You need that replicable process to develop consumer insight or customer insight. You need to find the unarticulated, we have to be unarticulated, the, people, the things that people can't tell you that they need, but they, but they certainly exist. Okay? And you need processes that are, you know, how do you take those out there ideas, the really absurd kind of wow ideas? If you could do that, that would be awesome. How could you take that and build feasibility into it rather than saying, boy, I can't do that. You know, that's, that sounds like it's impossible. So how do you take the, quote, impossible ideas and really make, make them work? So all of those processes and thinking skills and climate really contribute that when you bring them all together, that's where innovation can really flourish. So let's get specific about an Energizer. You've created a, a, a great mission and vision. Um, your mission through innovation, simplify and enhance the lives of our customers and consumers better than anyone else. But what does that mean? Are you gonna be better than P&G? Are you gonna be better than Unilever? Are you gonna do this better than anybody else? Because that's what it says. So how are we gonna do that? And we've talked about, you've got these three drivers, insight, innovation and execution. So let's talk about each one of them because indeed, fuel the future, it's all about using insight, innovation and execution as, if you will, the fuel that will take you to the future. So let's talk a little bit about insight. 
discovering insight is really key. Um, and it applies to more than just marketing. You're gonna, keep me, you're gonna keep hearing me say that because a lot of marketing people and research people, they know that their responsibility is consumer insight or customer insight. But the entire organization, operations, finance, everyone should be playing a role in the insight process for whoever their customer is. So what are those unmet needs with your, your retail customers? Or how do you understand the consumer and needs in a different way? Or what does the consumer need when she's in the, the retail environment? So, so insight's gonna be really key, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that <coughs> during, uh, during this hour together. But having insights is only the start. So how do you take those insights and build focused, innovative solutions for customers and consumers? It's certainly about recognizing the new needs in the marketplace and bringing innovative new products. But it's, again, it's not just about new products. Innovation, insight should drive innovation in all of the ways that you touch your consumers and your customers. So if you work in inventory management or supply chain or logistical systems, it's just as important to apply innovation to those areas as it is to the pure marketing activities. And how do we deliver those innovative solutions both effectively and efficiently? Great execution in the marketplace creates satisfied customers and they're the ones who recommend, support, and appreciate your building real value with them. So if you want to lead, you have to be out in front. You have to be trying new things, experimenting, understanding how to discover real insight, and build it into some fresh possibilities. Okay, so let's try this out. Which of these is an insight? So A says, moms want nothing to get in the way of fun family memories in the sun. And B says, moms prefer sun care brands that have the maximum SPF and UV protection for their family. So which one, let me just talk a little bit about the definition of insight. We say an insight is a penetrating discovery about consumer or customer motivation applied to unlock growth. It's what the consumers want, need, or believe. So with that definition, now, what do we think, which one of these do we think is the insight? It's A. A describes what's motivating. It says, if I want nothing to get in the way of fun family memories, I'm gonna do whatever I can to promote those memories. And it's, it's really about, um, it explains the why behind the choices. It says, I'm gonna choose that because I want I want to make the most out of the family memories. B is a lovely and important fact, but it's not an insight. It represents really just something that might help you, you know, position a product or a little bit, or maybe put a packaging call out, or maybe the, the um, formulation, but it doesn't say what's motivating. It just says they prefer, but you don't know why. So the why behind things is really what the insight um, leads us to do. So it really helps us to kind of understand you know, how something could be useful in the marketplace because you can build all sorts of things behind once you know the why. I think insight is a real team activity. It's, um, it's really not the responsibility of a few people in the organization. And I know I'm being a little pedantic here to emphasize that, but I want you to think that everybody in this room has a responsibility for, for insight. So no matter what your functional area, marketing, operations, finance, human resources, et cetera, you should be engaged in actively in the insight process. So what are some of the principles? First, they are derived from a deep understanding of consumers and customers. You have to get below the surface to understand that, that those whys of behavior. And they are about Thoughts, beliefs, feelings, okay? The motivations on, on influence. The motivations to say, this is why someone is behaving the way they do. They are not conventional wisdom. So they're either new or they're new to us. They're newly discovered or there's something that we didn't see in the same, um, in the same perspective before. And by discovering the insights, there's implications right there, you can see it when you discover it, 
that you can apply to, to, um, to drive some brand growth. It's an aha moment with profound implications. So genuine insights in business. First, they result from making new connections. So to do great insight, you've got to be a really good connection, connection maker. Um, and really, if you studied psychology or anthropology or the social sciences in, in, uh, in college, some of those skills really come to, to bear here uh, to really understand why people behave in the way that they do. They're simple and focused rather than general. And they arise from the context of that identified need in an ever-changing world. Because someone said to me once, well, why can't you just you know, make a list of all the insights in the world, you know, the things that drive behavior, and then you're kind of done, and you can kind of get on with marketing and all the other stuff. But it's context that's changing. Context changes, even though some, there's some universal truths about behavior, but they change with context. And I'm going to talk about that in a couple of minutes. And they're immediately useful because they suggest a way of meeting that need in, in, a, in a powerful way. An insight is not any old piece of information or data. Okay? A lot of people use the term interchangeably with, with information. But I'd like you to have the discipline to start using the word insight mostly about motivation for behavior. It's not common knowledge. It's not the result of pure analytical kind of approaches. And it's not a justification for a currently held view. I've known some, some companies that, that used it in that way. So when you have insight, what do you do with it? You have to develop the implications. How do you create those new and different ways to capitalize on the insight? And that's where you need now to really pull in your imagination so that you can get your creative thinking um, abilities to see some, some, imagine some new ways of profiting from those insights. So, if insights are penetrating discoveries about consumer or customer motivation, what does innovation mean? Innovation is the result of using those insights to develop creative implications and then acting on them. So we have a, 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 little, a little innovation formula. First of all, creativity. It's a function of climate times thinking. Now, we all need to be more creative in our work. No question about it. But if it's pure creativity and it doesn't result in something, you know, it's, it's nice for art, but maybe not so great for business. So the innovation formula adds two pieces. That is a function of climate times thinking, times insight, times action. And it's real, for real innovation, we have to add the insight and action to the formula. So great innovation requires us to position and present ideas in a really powerful way. The customers and consumers cannot always see how they could use something. Remember that buyer from, from Macy's who couldn't really see what he would do with, with uh, wheels on luggage? Did anyone here ever ask for a fax machine or a Bluetooth device or a mobile phone? But we all had communication needs. So understanding those needs, not being told by your customer or your consumer what they need, but figuring out what it is and then, and then inventing from it. You need to know their needs almost before they know their needs. OK, so the third piece. Insights are penetrating discoveries about motivation. And innovation is a result of developing implications and acting on those insights. So what makes great execution happen? Execution is a focus group of behaviors and processes that are applied to move innovation from concept, from an idea, into results. It's execution that provides that superior value for customers and consumers. You bring agility, you bring, you bring discipline, to the marketplace. You know what? It's easier to say than it is to do it. So there's four specific areas I'd like to just mention that are really critical to great execution. So like a great sports franchise, when you move from concepts to results, you gotta think like a team. So first, you need a systems framework. Systems require this total interconnectedness so that everybody in the organization is connected to everybody else in the organization. It's not just about I do my job, but it's the recognition that it's a big link. And if anyone in the organization 
doesn't bring their full commitment and passion to it, things can, things can, um, can fall apart. You need to integrate process management and project management. Second, you need to work exceptionally well cross-functionally. And that's going to require some authentic buy-in and ownership from everywhere in the organization. Everywhere in the organization needs to feel that they're an important piece of the, of the puzzle. And it hinges on that climate again, so climate comes back, a climate of collaboration along with a true passion for the consumer and the customer. We all are working on behalf of the consumer and the customer. Third, the organization needs great skills in creative problem solving. Because inevitably, bringing execution to market, you hit, you hit bumps. You have to problem solve. And the more you can have great creative problem solving in the organization, you can sustain really great commitment to innovative solutions. And lastly, the organization needs to be able to work in compressed time frames with agility and discipline, with a critical path focus, because you've got a scoreboard up there and you've got a limited time to be able to do it. So to be successful in business, in innovation, sorry, we have to be conscious of these two different types of thinking and working. Now, most of us, no matter what our positions are, we spend 90 plus percent of our time over in that operational world. It's um, rational, uh, routine, rules, procedures, decision making, um, you know, the kind of things that you know, good business schools teach you all, all, all how to do. But if you, want to, if you want to develop new and innovative possibilities, you have to toggle over. You have to come over to this innovation world. Now, the innovation world, it's the what if kind of world. It's curious, it's speculative, it makes connections, it's experimental. It tries different things, there's surprise to it. We often say it's approximate, not precise. Because if you judge everything based on the precision of an idea when, you, when you're developing it on innovation, at first, you'll reject every idea because they're not, they're not perfectly formed. So if you want to come over to that innovation world, you really have to be conscious of that crossover and, and, and be specific with your, with your colleagues that we're in that what if mode, that in innovation mode, that, that experimental kind of thing to try some new things um, when, in, in terms of thinking styles and behaviors. It's important that you use those new thinking styles and behaviors in the context of a supportive culture. Okay, you can't be experimental and speculative when you're being judged and second-guessed. So if you think of organizational um, culture on a spectrum, at any point in time, we only have a certain amount of energy to bring uh, to bring to a meeting or to, to our work. Our first priority has to be to take care of ourselves, both consciously as well as subconsciously. So in threatening situations, you're in an energy crisis because you, you spend all your time kind of in what we call safekeeping mode rather than in generating new ideas in, in, in toward the task. If you move your climate more toward uh, the cooperative and collaborative side, you can have more mental energy to invent or play with new thinking. So a lot of business, uh, unconsciously, a lot of business um, procedures and so forth tend to move the climate in the wrong direction for innovation. So if you want to really have a role in your organization, wherever you might be based, the more you can push that climate to the right, over to collaborative, over to supportive, cooperative, you will get much better results because everyone in the organization will be able to bring more mental energy to creatively solving tasks and coming up with new ideas and concepts rather than in being in a safekeeping mode. So what we want to do is to really see the world with, with a fresh set of eyes, see the world with new eyes. We want you to be a, you know, more open-minded, more of a blank slate, especially when you're listening to customers and consumers. We want to actually listen to those customers and consumers in fresh ways, in their own environments, and get out of our own comfort zones to get into a more empathetic mode. So I want you to look out, be out there looking for paradox and contradictions in the marketplace in terms of consumer or customer behavior. That's where opportunity can often hide. 
and I'd like you to be aware of your own filters. You know, we all have our own map of the world. What we see out there is not necessarily what's inside of our head. Okay? So we might see an external map. And in fact, if you remember, um, I think it was eight, nine years ago, there was a sniping incident in Washington, D.C. So it's a U.S. example. And there were two guys who were shooting at people. And they killed a lot of people. And the whole marketplace was in panic for a number of days. Now, I don't know, I know this was international news, but does anybody remember what they were looking for? What did the police say they were looking for? White man. Anybody remember? White man. When they finally found those guys, they were in a blue Chevelle with a hollowed out rear end so the guy could shoot out of the, uh, out of the trunk. So we all have these white vans in our head because we see things and, and we don't see uh, the truth. Of course, there's a thousand white vans at every, every stoplight. So you know, somebody saw one and then it got into people's heads and then we're, done, we're only looking for that. So the, sometimes the more time you've spent in a category or in a business, sometimes the more you think you got all the answers. And yet, you don't have the whole story because we all, we kind of have these perceptual filters we distort, we generalize, we delete to make all of the knowledge that's coming in, all the information that's coming into us to make sense of it. So, you know, we kind of tend to filter out the observations and facts that don't fit our internal reality. And yet that's when we, exactly when we need to be most paying attention and most open-minded to new information. When we open ourselves up to new ways of thinking, we have the possibility of, of real breakthrough. To discover something in ourselves, in our customers, our consumers, and capitalize on, capitalize on it in a, new, in a new way. Something the competitors haven't seen. So I heard, I think Alan asked, you know, are you going to be able to outdo this in terms of like the P&Gs of the world? Well, to be successful, that's exactly what you have to do. You have to see something that they don't see. See an opportunity. And you have that ability if you can manage these filters um, to kind of open up your thinking to, to fre a fresh approach. It's all about this open-minded connection making to bring new connections to the marketplace. So you, the, the opportunity there is to really, no matter what you're working on, is to start in a bit of a fresh place and to rethink it, not, not from the middle, but think it, rethink it from the beginning. So, you have to use what we call them the code cracking skills. Get in between the lines of what people say and what, what you observe. What are you seeing, what are you hearing that you can focus on understanding in a fresh way? To use the connection making skills that we were born with. Kind of the essence of creativity is making new connections. Now, we're all born with creative, really creative, uh, creative thinking skills. Those of you who are parents know that when you get about four or five, your, your, your little guys and, and gals, no, there's no, no limits on them, right? They, they have so fanciful and they, they love to, to they tell stories and these wonderful kinds of creatures and so forth. So creativity, we're all born with it, right? What happens about age six? In the U.S., it's about age six, five, six. What do we all do when we go about five or six? We go to school. What happens? It's not about creativity anymore. You know, it's about let's color within the lines. Okay, let's get the right answer to these questions. And those are all, I mean, those, that's a, those are good things. We want to get the right answers to problems and so forth, but, it starts, to, it starts to keep us away from our inherent creati uh, creativity skills. So we all have that capacity, and what we want people to do is really re kind of get back in touch with their creative thinking abilities. It's, um, it, and it's taking those creative, but you know, we all, you know, we go to trade shows, or we talk to customers, or we look at the retail environment, and we get some ideas. And those are pretty good, okay? But that's fairly close in thinking. 
The kind of thinking that I'm talking about to really get breakthrough ideas has to be with you connecting farther out. And I'm going to talk about what, what, the, what the spectrum of thinking really looks like. But it's the apparently irrelevant, apparently irrelevant sources where the most potential for breakthrough um, can happen. So the more you have people with diverse backgrounds and you have lots of interests outside of the office as well as in the office, you can bring new farther out thinking and make new connections with your business issues and problems or your consumer, what you're observing about the consumer. Originality comes from both relevant as well as those irrelevant sources. Also, you have to break connections. I said before, the longer you've been in a category, maybe you've got some kind of um, set ways of thinking about things. And yet, if you really want to um, get into original and innovative thinking, I want you to think about kind of breaking the, 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 um, the, old, the old thought patterns. We have to move beyond safekeeping ideas to newer and experimental ideas. So what do I mean? Safekeeping ideas are relevance oriented, they're modeled after thoughts that we think other people will approve. Okay, no one's going to get, I'm not going to get in trouble for that. Okay? They're factual, they're logical, they're analytical, they're precise. They're surprise free. But how about experimental? The characteristics of experimental ideas they're spontaneous, they're speculative, they're approximate rather than precise. They're surprising and can violate kind of com common principles and, uh, and conventions. They're often metaphorical and image-based rather than factual and analytical. And they connect things that have never been connected before. So if you want breakthrough ideas, I'd like to introduce you to this idea of the spectrum of thinking. For more, for more interesting solutions to whatever creative problem solving you're doing, you need to kind of get farther out. Okay, we move from, from the pure rational thinking down there in the purple. We get diversity, we bring diverse groups together, those are things that are good. And maybe we even try wishing, right? Because you don't have to defend a wish. You can say, I wish we blah, blah, blah had in our marketplace. And nobody, nobody really says, you know, okay, you don't, you don't need to defend, defend that. But to get farther out, you have to go First, tapping into metaphor or analogy. What is something like? What, you know, what could you compare it to? There are thousands and thousands of inventions that all came from metaphor, looking at it and comparing it, comparing it to something else, including ma many of the most important scientific discoveries. Einstein was a huge, huge generator of metaphorical images to try to try to engage well, you know, his, 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 his th th um, theories in physics. Okay? And then the most far out is really irrelevance or absurdity. And I know you all think I'm you know, a little nutty about this, but that's where real breakthrough can happen because we say it's irrelevance, but it's seeming irrelevance. And that when you connect things that don't seem to have a have a, a way to come together, that's where breakthrough really can, ha can happen. So the further out you push your thinking, the higher you can go. And the more ideas you want out there, that's why it's so important. Back to climate, that you have a trust relationship with the teammates, whoever you're working with, because that climate is so important. If you're worrying about safekeeping when you're coming up with ideas, you'll never get out to those, to those farther, farther thinking opportunities. Okay, let's do a, little, a few examples. So one great example uh, for insight innovation and execution is Starbucks. And originally Starbucks came from an insight, right? Coffee's not just about the beverage, it was about the experience, okay? So it's a place, it's a, it's a time, take a break, you know, everybody has these hectic lives, um, at home and at work and allowing them to escape for a little while. And they connected with people, not by marketing directly to them, because you know, Starbucks didn't, used to, didn't do advertising or anything. It was just word of mouth, people, experience. Okay? And this is back when coffee, coffee used to be a commodity. So you know, people didn't think of it as an experiential kind of thing. And they turned the business model on, on their heads. 
they found all these creative ways of presenting and packaging things back to the consumer. And then what happened? So it was once one of the, one of the fastest growing stocks, one of the fastest growing retailers. They had a spiraling fall from grace. In their zeal to hit, I think they were looking for about 40,000 uh, locations globally. The company made very poor selections on, on some sites. They distracted themselves into, you know, with forays into movies and, uh, and music. And they cluttered their stores with too much merchandise. They really lost focus on the coffee experience. And now in 2008, we all know what happened. Well, I just heard you guys talk about the, the, how, what a difficult year last year was. Well, almost every business went through this, okay? So what happened 2008, 2009? High prices, out of style. So when I talked about context, that's what I mean, context. You know, in 2007, yeah, I'll pay five, you know, five bucks for that frappuccino, whatever. Not after the economic crisis. So the, the lesson is, you've got insights. It's not just a universal list of things that people are motivated by, but it's within the context that we're operating in. Um, in. And when circumstances change, you have to re-examine your insights and their implications. So customers reined in spending. S Starbucks had to aggressively reposition itself. Okay, it had to return to its focus on the coffee experience and create more affordability. Now, I looked at the stock price last week uh, for Starbucks, they're back 130%, up 130% versus one year ago. Now, they're not back to their historical highs, but they've made a huge um, difference in the marketplace by adjusting themselves to the marketplace with, in terms of insight, innovation, and execution. So, as Jack Welch says, an organization's ability to learn and translate that learning into action is the ultimate competitive advantage. So let me tell, let's do another little story. I'd like to s share a little example of some innovation work we helped a longtime client with over, over a decade ago. I think it might be 14, 15 years now. Jose Cuervo, or as I call him, JC, had grown up promoting the brand alongside beach volleyball. Two-man beach volleyball, they call it. And they had grown from, uh, in parallel, as a small boutique, product and a small boutique sport. I mean, it was really Beach Volleyball's first major sponsor back in 1978, the years when the legendary Ron Van Hagen, and I used to know him, um, he was the big star of beach, of beach Volleyball, back in Manhattan Beach and Redondo Beach. You can tell I'm an ex-Californian, huh? Beach Volleyball. But when other big companies started to promote along, you know, with Beach Volleyball, like the big beer companies all came in, you know, they lost, they lost the uniqueness to their marketing program. They, they decided, you know, they didn't have the same power um, that it had, had once had. This is about 1994, 95. So the brand had to find a way to bring uniqueness and differentiation in a new and powerful way to its marketing program. And you know what? The Cuervo Group really knew its consumer well. They had a great insight, and the insight is that they wanted to pursue their life with freedom and independence. Now, freedom is one of those universal kinds of people want to be free, but this is a different kind of free. This was about connected to doing your own thing without worrying about conventions and, and the status quo. They really were kind of a free-spirited kind of group. The core consumer just thought of themselves as, you know, not ha even if they wore a suit to work the next day, when they were on their own time, they were they were free. They were not one of those corporate monkeys, you know? So they had that great insight. So what are you going to do with that? Well, how about if you become a citizen of a new nation? Taking the insight about freedom, they wished for a new country where they could have their own rules and pursue their own dreams. The Republic of, of Cuervo was born. OK, it's an actual island that the brand leased. They leased it in the Caribbean, not even in Mexico where tequila comes from. Okay, it's just a little spit of a key. That is it, that's the whole, that's the complete uh, Republic of, Cuer of Cuervo. 
So if you were evaluating this idea, when your marketing people bring this to you, what would you say? You would say, gee, how many Querville consumers can we get? I mean, really, that island's not going to hold all of our cons It will only hold, you know, a couple hundred people. There's no way we could get some, something going with, with uh, our, our consumers at, at that island. Okay? So people were thinking, okay, it's, it could be pretty limiting. We can't send all those consumers down there. So what we helped the Querville team see is that the Republic could be both a real place as well as a metaphorical place. So we created a declaration of independence that says, wherever friends gather for a good time, Cuervo is there. Okay, so Cuervo Nation exists as a state of mind as much as an actual place. And of course, you can still have a little fun with the metaphor. You know, they can create your own flag. And this is a, a, <coughs> a picture of the mob that was mobbing outside of the United Nations, seeking entry as a new republic. Now, of course, it was tongue in cheek. But do you know how much publicity they got and how, much, how exciting this was for their, for their consumers? You can, they even petitioned the, U, the, uh, the, Olymp, the International Olympic Committee to field their own beach volleyball team. At that time, they were considering, now, you know, beach volleyball is now a, a major Olympic sport, but it wasn't at the time. And so they wanted to bring their own beach volleyball t team into the Olympics. And again, press and things happened. They created embassies at bars all around the world. This went, went totally global, okay, and spread its culture around the world. Here's what the results were. Very impressive. In the US, which was one of the most mature markets when the campaign started, it's been executed as a marketing program all over the world, and the, and the website is easily um, accessed um, as a separate site. So it's been touted by marketing experts as one of the best uh, communication programs ever. So it, it really, the sales increased tr exponentially over this, over this period of time. And it was accomplished because, what did I say in the beginning? Climate thinking process. The climate to listen to new, crazy, absurd idea, and not just say, well, we can't get all those consumers down there. The thinking to push their thinking out on a kind of, wow, if we could do that idea, but ooh, how could we do that? So developmental thinking, creative thinking, and processes. To, they had an insight process, they had an innovation process. They, built, they had a process to build feasibility into an initially crazy idea. In short, they brought it all together, insight, innovation, and execution. Now here's another example. Uh, Safeguard Soap, one of your competitors, P&G. P&G took the brand from generic clean to having a bar soap aid the healthy development of children. So it's not just about clean, it's about we help your children develop in a healthy way. They capitalized on a universal insight that parents, no matter where they are, certainly want their, their children to grow up to be healthy individuals. And kids, like kids, they don't always want to stop and to wash, stop and, and um, to stop playing and wash their hands. And sometimes they don't even have the right kind of facilities. So this example is uh, Pakistan. They created some new characters to kind of enliven the, uh, the hygiene story and to teach children to be more vigilant about washing their hands. So a character called Dirtu, Dirtu, is the king of all germs. This evil character believes germs rule the earth. And he enjoys making kids sick. Boo. The hero is, is a character called Commander Safeguard, who foils Dirtu's plans by getting kids to wash their hands with Safeguard. Now, the way Safeguard did this is they also sponsored all sorts of children and family hygiene initiatives, including building things like hand washing facilities all over the country in schools and in public places. And Safeguard is the world's number one antibacterial soap worldwide. Another example, Lenore Downey. Downey offers a family of products to help um, clothes and fabrics look, smell, feel their best. Um, it was first introduced back in 1960. 
and over the years, innovations have included the downy ball dispenser, which is a very you know, convenient kind of product you throw in your washer, or the downy wrinkle uh, release releases with or without, um, you know, so you can use it with an iron or without an iron. So in Europe and the Middle East and um, African and Asia markets, I believe downy um, technologies are marketed under the Lenore brand. So the big insight for, for Lenore was to move beyond functional benefits of softening to an insight that women want to comfort themselves and their families. Their advertising focuses on the comfort of the clothing, feeling like your clothes are not there. So that, that gal there is like thinking that she's got no clothes on because she's so comfortable. In fact, the brand took it even farther and now focuses on helping women get some me time for themselves as an aspect of comfort. So here's a quote from the website. In these time pressured days, the idea of taking time out just for yourself can seem like wishful thinking and any attempts to simplify your life may be easier said than done. However, Lenore recognizes that even by making the process of doing the laundry easier and more pleasurable, it can allow you to free up a little more precious time to do the things you really enjoy and recharge your batteries. And I hope those are energizer batteries. It goes on to, you know, to explain some me, me time tips. I mean, I thought, wow, a fabric softener that capitalizes on comfort and giving women time for themselves that's amazing. And that brand, those two brands combined, are the number one brand of, of fabric softeners um, globally. OK, how about Surf? Surf detergent, Unilever brand. So where water is scarce, expensive, and human labor is needed, a whole new approach to laundry detergent was developed by Unilever. Like most detergents focus on getting clothes clean and removing stains, and they took a little bit of a different tack. In India, Surf is a premium brand. Surf Excel was relaunched with a new formula to reduce rinsing and to conserve water. So instead of focusing purely on stains and getting clothes clean, they truly understood their consumer. And they developed an insight that the consumer wanted to get their clothes clean with the recognition that laundry was a big expensive hassle because of the need for so much water. So more lather meant more rinsing which means, you know, which you really use scarce water resources unnecessarily. The consumer believed, though, that the soap lather meant cleaner, cleaner clothes. So, so sorry, Surf reformulated its, its detergent, Surf Excel, to produce less foam during washing, and less water, therefore, is needed to rinse those clothes, saving at least two buckets per wash. Now, this makes a huge difference. This particular um, example is from India where the dry southern states of India, many people spend more money on the water than they do on the detergent, okay? And you don't have to lug the water, you know, saving two buckets makes, makes a really big difference for every, every load. Um, washing clothes apparently um, accounts for almost a quarter of all water usage in the southern um, states of, I'm gonna probably blow the pronunciation, so if you're from India, forgive me. Tamil Nadu? Yes. That's okay, oh God, there. And Andhra Pradesh, yes, I did it. <laughs> so in 2004, they relaunched the product in those two states, promising to save people two buckets of water a day without compromising on stain removal. And those sales have increased by over 50% in those two states since its relaunch. Or how about an example from, from Australia? Everybody knows Dove's campaign for real beauty. Most women don't see themselves as beautiful. Um, only 2%, I think, of all women in the world describe themselves as beautiful. And most agree that the media puts too much emphasis on you know, a, standard, a standardized view of beauty. Um, so they've done a great job. Um, they, they've created the Dove Bar as the world's number one uh, skin cleansing brand. But they decided to move beyond into hair care. So three quarters of all Australian women believe that heating, heated styling appliances were extremely are very damaging to their hair. But they weren't willing to have a bad hair day and give it up, okay, to achieve this, the hairstyle that they're looking for. So Dove developed the Dove Heat Defense Therapy System to repair and protect from the damage caused by heated appliances at every stage of the daily hair care routine. So how the system works, everything in the range has this patented serum that has heat shield technology. It's made up of all these tiny droplets that coat the hair 
in a protective film. So it dissipates the heat and it reduces the temperature experienced by the, uh, experienced by, by the hair while you're blow drying and straightening uh, um, your hair. So Dove had really capitalized on a powerful insight in a totally new and innovative way. Finally, the story of Ferrara Rocher. This remarkable story began in 1946 in Italy where, you know, after the war, candy and confections were in short supply and people mostly bought from small specialty sh uh, shops. So in the small town of Alba in northern Italy, the master confectioner uh, Pietro Ferrero developed a system that enabled him to mass produce true quality confections and offer them to consumers at, at very reasonable prices. So understanding that insight, everybody wants a little treat wrapped up in a high quality confection surprise. And we all know what deep emotional connections some of us have with chocolate. Not me, of course. Okay. So if you look at what Ferrero Rocher did, look at their gift box, gold foil, premium looking. All of that has totally benefited the brand as it's moved into new global markets. For instance, it, it's taken off in Hong Kong, where people are, you know, they enjoy more conspicuous kind of uh, consumption of brands, and they, they really like branded images. So as China opened up, people from Hong Kong who had family in China would bring back uh, those chocolates, for our chocolates for the Chinese New Year, which I know is coming up, what, this weekend, right? Um, and they would bring gifts. So one of the most popular gifts became Ferraro Rocher. It's really the first impression the consumers had of foreign chocolate. And what a great image. Foreign, exotic, indulgent, and it looks very high priced. This is a real family run success story. It's so surprising. Their market share is higher at 7.3% in a very fragmented category, but ahead of more well known companies like Cadbury and Hershey. It's amazing. So it all comes back to the basics putting the thinking skills, the behaviors that uh, support a great climate and great innovation processes into place. So I hope you will think about how you can use these to bring more insight-led innovation and great execution to the Energizer organization. So here's just a few suggestions to think about. First, give it a try and do it quickly. You know, use insight process and an innovation process to lay out a bunch of stuff. And you know, just try some things and keep what works. Keep on trying, keep on trying. Number two, accept that you're going to make some mistakes. But just learn from the mistakes and don't make those mistakes uh, again. But it's that trying new things that's really critical. Number three, take some small baby steps. You know, experiment on some, in some small ways. Um, when something looks promising, then you can go all out and really kind of capitalize on the opportunity. That's why you can do lots of inexpensive experiments that create a funnel of, of new innovation ideas. Fourth, give your people the room they need. Without entrepreneurship, without experimentation, there's no successes to be had. So people need some time, some incentives, um, some room to experiment. And fifth, Get some mechanisms, build that clock. We want to harness creativity and build innovation. You can't do it simply by chance. You need some kind of processes um, and practices that are tangible mechanisms uh, to try out some new ideas and some innovations. So vision without action is merely dreaming, but action with no vision is just passing time. But with vision and action, you can change the world. Thank you very much.